Hi, I'm Julianne Hartman, and welcome to The Journey. Today's show is about my friend Colleen Yamarino. Now, Colleen had a, a very crazy life growing up. Not only did she have a similar background like mine with an alcoholic father, very dysfunctional, but she was pregnant at 15. She was married several times to men that were very abusive to her. It is an incredible story that you don't want to miss. Not only did she have all of those problems, but she also ended up with the worst back pain that anybody could ever live with, screaming in pain most days with her back. She was finally diagnosed with RSD. And so because of that, she had to take many, many uh, medications to try to just at least keep her in a state where she could function at least just be alive. So I can't wait for you to see part three of Colleen Yamarino's story. Welcome back to The Journey. This is part three with Colleen Yamarino. And wow, this story, what I love about all these episodes is it is leading up to show you how and why things happen to us. You know, we get to an age, let's say we're in our 40s or 50s, and this, you know, this sickness, this, these conditions, these diseases show up and you say, how did this happen? Well, we are giving you a full, complete story on how this happens. All the rejection, all the sadness, the drugs, the alcohol, whatever it is, you know, whatever, the, the, the bad relationships. Um, and that's how we find out how these things do happen. Mm-hmm. And especially without Jesus, any bad thing can happen. Yes. So, okay. So now you've run into your, your factory and you're yelling, I'm saved, I'm saved. And you should probably be too. And I'm sure yes. you're not accepted real well on that one. Um, so let, let me know, what did that look like at your office? But the main thing I want to get to is what about your relationship with your daughters? Mm-hmm. How, how did all this, because now they've seen uh, three men mm-hmm. and how, how did that work out? Like, how did you talk to them? Did they, you know, uh, did they like those, you know, their, their stepdads? Mm-hmm. Uh, like what was going on? Were they angry with you? You mm-hmm. let me know. Yeah, no, those are great questions. Um, <clears throat> I was really fortunate that um, the, you know, their, their, um, biological father had basically told them, you know, that um, he was getting married again and he just didn't have time for them anymore. So, and they were very little when that happened. And I know that that rejection went into their heart, but they never really said much about it. You know, they just didn't understand why their daddy wouldn't want them. Right. But now, you know, of course, because they're both born again, spirit filled, they love Jesus, you know, and, uh, but then it was hard for them, you know, and, um, and then being with somebody else, they don't even really remember the second guy that very much, thankfully, I believe that's a godsend. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> but the, the um, gentleman that I got saved with, um, you know, he did, he was, he was a good father to them, um, for, you know, quite a while until they started getting older. Mm. And then because there were already things going on in his life that I didn't know about, um, that was starting to manifest outwardly. And, uh, you know, and here I am, I have dove into being a Christian, like head first, I don't care what was going to happen. Um, so my youngest daughter, when she was seven, we were at church <clears throat> and uh, just had just, you know, heard the whole message and the pastor gave a an altar call and she just looked up and she said, I'm going. <clears throat> and she ran down to that altar and I'm like, oh my gosh. So I ran down there with her, you know, I'm like my little seven year old is down there at the altar. And so I went down there, you know, and I was just standing there with her and she accepted Jesus. And I'm telling you, you know, today she's a worship leader. She's a co-senior pastor of a church. I mean, her, what God has. Amazing worship leader. Yeah. And I could be her mom because it's red hair. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, she does. She's she's the one that has the strawberry blonde hair. Yeah. And then my oldest daughter has the darker auburn, you know, beautiful curl hair. And um, 
But then my oldest daughter, it, she got saved a little bit later, you know, and, uh, but, you know, <clears throat> at, during all this time, you know, the only model that I had on how to be a mom was my mother. And that was not a very good model. And, you know, even though I tried so hard, you know, because even today, now they're older, right? They have their, my oldest daughter has two boys um, and my youngest daughter married, has, has been married for uh, 19, uh, be almost 19 years. And, you know, um, but they didn't want to have children. And, but, you know, they're both successful in their own areas of life, right? And, um, you know, what happened to me as when I got saved, the first couple of years were like, I, I swear I was like living in heaven. You know what I mean? <clears throat> it, it was, life could not have been better. It was amazing. In my heart, I'm talking about. Bad things were still happening outwardly, but in my heart. And uh, also with the girls, you know, because they were seeing you know, like they'd get sick. I'd walk in and lay my hands on them. I said, no, you're going to be healed right now in Jesus name. Now get up. And they'd get up and they were healed. I mean, you know, I told my daughter's teeth to straighten out. They straightened out in Jesus name. I mean, we were seeing miracles, you know, and, um, but I started growing up in the word of faith movement. <clears throat> and what happened to me is I became very self-righteous, you know, and uh, I legalistic because the church even that I was going to was starting to get real legalistic, you know, and I didn't see it. I didn't see it coming. But, you know, so the girls would want to do stuff and I would say, well, what does the Bible say about that? And it's like I didn't have any grace. I didn't. You know what I'm saying there? There should have been many times when I said, you know what, that's okay. I think we're okay. Or letting them go, well, what do you think? Right. You know, right. You know, what is Jesus telling you? I didn't have that grace to do that. I didn't understand it. And, you know, I know we can't go back and redo life. <laughs> we can't. But if there was ever anything that I would ever want to go back and do again, would go back to, you know, really help my daughter's see life differently, you know, through Christ, through the grace of God. But in spite of those things, you know, my oldest daughter and I, and she'll be the first one to tell you, we, we, you know, we, we butted heads quite a bit as she was growing up because she was very strong willed. Her mother was very strong. I was going to say, it sounds like her mom <laughs> was too. You know? And, uh, you know, but my youngest daughter, she was always the one that was like, it's going to be okay. God's going to take care of us, you know, because she just didn't want to see the arguing. And she yeah. didn't want that because, you know, she just wanted peace, you know, yeah. which is what yeah. we all wanted too, right? But you get two strong willed people, and, you know, I'm getting legalistic in the word. And, you know, my oldest daughter's just trying to understand who God is. And, you know, why is my mom being like this, you know, and why can't I go and do this or, you know, things like that. But in spite of all that, we have wonderful relationships together now, you know, and even though both girls are day and night, day and night, they are so different from each other, but they love each other um, and they know how to love each other, right? Based on who they are. Um, but I love my girls and, you know, I remember one time, um, Tessa, my youngest daughter, she wrote me, uh, she sent a card to me with a little letter inside. And she knew, because one day I just, I couldn't hold it in any longer. And I told her about, you know, the hysterectomy and how I'd wanted a, a, a little boy, you know, and I wanted the two girls and a little boy. That's just what I wanted. And she says, you know, mom, I'm so sorry that you never had the little boy that you wanted to have. But these two little girls that God gave to you will love you forever. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I mean, you know, so here's my adult daughter. Yes. Just sharing that with me. And, you know, that something on the inside of me broke. 
Oh, and I it really, it really helped me to, you know, start to see things differently, you know, in them. And in yes. Them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's now go fast forward a little bit into, um, because now you, we need to talk about your amazing husband that you're married to now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when did all this happen? When did you now, because when we left off the last episode, you were what, like 22, 23 at the factory getting saved. Okay. Yes. Now we're going to fast forward a couple years into you meeting David. Well, that's going to be like 18, 19 years. <laughs> wow. Okay. <coughs> and so, so um, were, were you single that whole time between? No, no. Okay. Not that whole time, but um, it, it was just like a self-fulfilling pattern again. You know? Okay. Um, but now, okay, but now you're saved. So yes. things were a little different, but there, well, there's 18 year difference uh, or a span between yes. when you got saved and then you met David. Yes. And uh, so I tried to stay in a marriage um, of a man who was sleeping with other women for almost the full 18 years. Oh, it okay. the first year of our marriage and it just kept going. But now, you know, as a Christian, I'm going, how, I can't get divorced. How can I get divorced? You know, I didn't want to shame the name of Christ. I didn't want to, you know, all these things. And I'm like, you know, my life has been nothing but one bad mistake and things happening over and over. And I'm like, God, it got to the point where I was like, God, why am I so unlovable? Why would someone want to marry me and then cheat on me? I, I just couldn't understand it. And uh, how did you find out he was cheating on you? Well, somebody called me and I had just led this young girl to the Lord and she worked with him where he worked. And somebody from where he worked called me and said, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but I think you have a right to know. And I'm like, what? Oh my gosh. And um, so, yeah, but um, that was pretty devastating. Um, well, that, so like, how does, how do you live with the man knowing that he's cheating, not just once or twice, but multiple times? I've never, I've never experienced something like that. How do you, do you just kind of ignore it? Like, what did you do? Well, at first, I mean, I was totally devastated. I was just like, I felt like God let me down. How could you do this to me? How could you save me and then let this happen to me? And that's because I didn't understand grace, right? And, uh, you know, I had started working because um, he, he was off and on working. It wasn't real consistent. And uh, I was very fortunate um, that God opened up a door of opportunity for me I started working for a German medical company and uh, I mean, I was, I got promoted and promoted and, you know, and, and so I was doing really well, but I started traveling. And so, but what happened is now I wouldn't travel while the girls were still at home when they left, then I started traveling because I wouldn't right. do that. And uh, so I came to him and I said, look, this is what they're offering me. You know, I would be the national sales manager now. I mean, I'm going to go, I'm going to be all over North America. I'll be traveling internationally. What do you think about that? If you don't like that, if that's not good for us, you know, it, I won't do it. I mean, I just laid it out there. And uh, well, of course, I didn't realize that he was glad that I was gone because he was into pornography. And, you know, um, then again, with other, I, I have no idea of all the things that he did. I know a few things, but I don't know at all. And then you would think, wait, a Christian, how, how could a Christian, I mean, especially when you're a new Christian, mm -hmm. we, we think everybody's perfect. So now yes, we he's do. a Christian, you saw this <clears throat> angelic thing happen to him mm -hmm. and he, now he's addicted to porn and he's cheating on you. It's like, how does this happen? Yeah. It's thoughts. Yeah. You know, there's, 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 you know, there's so much that the Lord has shown me over the years, you know. Oh, I'm sure. Of it. Because, at, you know, you get to a point in your life where you're like, okay, Lord, I need to understand some things. Because if I can't understand that, how do I keep from repeating things or from allowing yes. things to keep happening, right? And, 
you know, God hears that heart, that heart cry. That is so good because you do need to know so that you can break the pattern. Yes. Yes. And not just settle for what the world or the, 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 the Christian world says. Yes. It's, it's a generational curse. Well, no, it's something that you, if you're aware of it, you can stop that. Yes. Right in its tracks. Absolutely. So, so you were married to him for how many years? 18 years. 18 years. Okay. And then finally you just was like, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. Well, you- yeah, there were some things that happened at the very end that were like, okay, why am I doing this? You know, and I mean, even my daughters were like, mom, why would you, why would you do this to yourself? I'm like, what do you mean? Do this to myself. He's doing it to me. God's doing it to me. You know what I mean? Right. And, uh, and, and I remember Tessa was saying, mom, God's not doing this to you. You need to leave. And I'm like, sure. Now, you know, sin the unpardonable sin and go straight to hell. Right. I'll just do that. Why not? Right. But you know, that's where my mind was going. Yes. And, uh, but you know, um, you know, the devil is so evil. He's so evil. Um, I knew exactly when something switched in my mind and my thoughts and I started looking for somebody still being married. I started looking and I, I didn't know it until just maybe a year and a half ago, I think I was finally to a point where I said, Holy Spirit, you've got to show me how could I have done what I did? And he wow. showed me. And he showed me. So maybe I'll talk about that, you know, like in a teaching or something, but because I'll tell you, that is probably the number one thing that causes people to go down a wrong road. And it all starts with one thought. Yes. One thought that you don't take captive. And then it just starts strongholds, start building brick by brick by brick by brick. And so, um, but, you know, that has freed me. Right. But not then. So, you know, anyway, it, it, it was like, we're done. You've cheated on me for the last time. I can't do it. And uh, so I'm still traveling. My body now is just really starting to hurt a lot. I mean, muscles sore. My back is aching all the time. You know, I'm because, you know, when I started traveling, it was like, not a lot of luggage was on wheels. Oh, right. You're right. So I was carrying these big bags, one here, one here with something slung over my shoulder, you know, and I mean, I was strong woman, but I shouldn't have been doing that stuff. Right. Right. And then we did so many trade shows and things like that. Then, you know, then our boss would say, she'd kind of, okay, you take this big long case and you over there, the marketing person, you take this big long case and the product person, you take this big long case, right? So here we are, got our own luggage plus all this other stuff. And I mean, seriously, and then you go and you're setting up these huge boots and you're tearing them down and I'm on planes, you know, not flying first class. <laughs> Let me tell right. you, it's right. all economy, you know, you're all squished together and, you know, and, uh, and then driving in cars and, you know, sleeping in hotel rooms all the time. I was traveling 50 to 60% of the time. So I was traveling a lot. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, so I, things started now. Now, remember, you know, all this stress. Now I get saved. And man, for years, it's like, I don't care who does what to me. It didn't matter, right? That's why I could forgive him, you know, for sleeping with somebody our first year of marriage. We got through it, you know, but see, I didn't know that these things were continuing right. until like five, six years later. And I find out it's been happening over and over and over. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, and instead of dealing with it, I, I wouldn't go to the pastor. I'd threaten him that I'd go to our pastor, but if I would have gone to my past, our pastor, I, it wouldn't, it would have been horrible, horrible, legalistic law. You know, what are you doing? You're traveling. You shouldn't be doing it. Was right. Like, your fault. Yes. I couldn't do it. Um, but that was my fault because I, I just kept letting things go. It was, it really was, I had to come down to it, you know, that it was. So anyway, I'm on a, a trip 
a big, we're at a huge trade show, one of the biggest ones that we have of the year. And I run into my now husband, and that was 22 years ago. And um, just one of the most beautiful, handsome men I've ever seen in my <laughs> entire life. <laughs> I mean, literally, I had never felt like that about anybody, ever. Now, mind you, I'm not, I've blown it. I feel like my life as a Christian is over. God is never going to love me again. Um, it's just those thoughts, you know, that I did yes, not yes. do anything with. And uh, so he and I start dating. Now, he's living in a, another state. So actually, it was a good thing. We were, it was a long distance relationship. Um, but, you know, within a year, things started getting serious between he and I. And uh, two and a half years into our dating, he asked me to marry him. We got engaged. And so then it starts. Are you going to move where I live or am I going to move where you live? Because it's got to happen. Right. So another two years goes by. And I finally said, okay. Either we make a decision now, either I come to Tennessee where you are, or you come to Ohio where I am, or I'm out of here. I've, I'm not going to do this again. I'm getting too old. Forget this stuff. I'm just not going there anymore. And uh, God just did a miracle. I had been working for this company for almost 12 years, and I made a decision to go work for another company, you know, because I felt like I was kind of at the ceiling I wasn't going to go any further and it was time for me to move on. Right. So I go in and I give my resignation to my boss. She's crying. I'm crying. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, what am I doing? I'm making the biggest mistake of my life, you know, and, and all this stuff. And so, you know, she accepts my resignation. I told her I'll stay for 30, 60 days, whatever she needs. I said, I've already talked to the other company and I told them I cannot just walk away. I, I would not do it or I won't work for them. Right. And they agreed to it. So um, literally 10 minutes after I give her my resignation, she calls me on my desk phone and says, what's David's phone number? And now she knew David. She knew my, you know, she knew him from trade shows and she has loved him. She wanted, she tried to, she wanted him to work for her. Well, now that I'm resigning, she called him and offered him, would you like to be the vice president of our sales and marketing department? So now David's going, oh my gosh, it's decision time. Because I had just, we had just talked and I said, either one of us does one thing right. or we're done, right? So he accepted her offer. And so, you know, within a month and a half, he had moved up to Ohio we uh, decided we were, okay, now what's our wedding date, right? Right. So we planned our wedding date. He moved up in November. We got married in August of the following year. And uh, during that time in November, somehow, I, I, it's like, I wish I remembered it more, but I remember he and I, we were going through a real struggle and I looked at him and I said, you must be born again. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, I, I was just like, you, you must be born again. This is not going to work for you and me. You have to know Jesus Christ as Savior like I do. And now, mind you, my brain's still telling me God hates me. I'm going to hell. Right, right. Yet my heart is saying something different. Yes. And David said, you're right. I want to accept him. And he accepted Christ right there. So I led him to the Lord. We get married in August, <clears throat> but now from that moment to August, the pain in my back is just becoming excruciating. So I've gone to my doctor. She's got me on all kinds of pain medication. Um, she's made me go to physical therapy, a lot of it. And because she says, I think we can fix it with, you know, physical therapy and, you know, the pain medication. And I'm like, okay. And um, but nothing, it's getting worse and worse and worse. So finally, she said, you need an MRI. You've got to go get an MRI. So, you know, um, uh, she recommends a uh, um, surgeon, orthopedic surgeon. 
So I go to the orthopedic surgeon, they take an MRI and they're like, oh my gosh, your discs are, they're trashed, like trashed. And um, it's, <clears throat> some of the disc is pushing on the sciatica nerve. That's why I was in so much pain. And so they what said- What was your that, pain level? From oh my gosh. Zero to 10. Uh, from one to 10, it was a 20. Hmm. Well, maybe it was a 15 at that time. Okay. It wasn't quite yet a 20. But it was probably around 15. Uh, they do the MRI. Uh, so David and I go in to consult with the doctor and he says, look, I know this is, it sounds terrible, but he goes, this is an easy surgery. We're going to go in, we're going to clean this up. You're going to be fine in six, eight weeks tops. You will be back traveling. You won't even know you had surgery. And I'm looking at David and now my husband has had four major back surgeries. So he was really pushing for me to do this because he was like, he knows how much it helped. Right. So <clears throat> because we both believed what the doctor said, you know, right. we're like, okay, I mean, right. six to eight weeks golden. This is yeah. great. I won't be in pain anymore. I mean, cause it was really hard on him and I, cause I, I was hard for me to drive longer than 30 minutes. And here I was trying to do my job flying all over the place. And then when I get to another state, because now I'm in a new job, I'm driving and carrying everything myself. I was like so miserable, you know, and then you'd walk into a client and you're like, hi, <laughs> you know, yeah. everything in your body hurts so bad. All you want to do is just lay down, you know, and take something and fall asleep. Um, but I couldn't do it. And so uh, after the MRI, we talked to the doctor and we both agree, okay, we're going to have the surgery. So I go to the new company that I'm working with and I said, okay, here's what's going to happen. I'm so sorry, but six to eight weeks tops, I'll be back. Trust me, you won't regret this. Everything's going to be great. Well, they loved me. Yeah, they really did. I'd known the people at this company for a long time. And they said, whatever you got to do, so I contact HR and said, okay, now I know my insurance doesn't kick in until, and I said, so if I wait and I have surgery, right, the day after this, are we okay? Because that they're like, I need to get into surgery as quickly as possible because it's damaging my nerves. So they're like, they check, they're like, yep, you're good, go do it, have the surgery. When I wake up in the recovery room, my body is jumping off the table by like eight to 12 inches. And David's like trying to hold me down. My sister's running and getting the nurses and the doctors because they don't know what's happening to me. That I'm, my, I was convulsing is what was happening. My body was in so much pain that when I finally started coming to, it was like, oh my gosh. And literally, and they've got you on, you know, a recovery table is not like a bed. And, uh, <clears throat> it was not very pleasant. Oh my gosh. So David holding, trying to hold my, and my body is just going like this. So they came over and me and they injected me. And again, now at that point, I, I don't even know what's going on. I remember that happening, but that's all I remember. Wow. They, they gave me so much medication, knocked me out. And of course they're now trying to figure out what's going on. Right. And they get the doctor back in there and he's looking and he's like, I just think it's her nerves. It's going to be okay. Just, just take her to her room. She's going to be fine. Just keep giving her medication. Well, that didn't work. The pain now was probably around a 20 plus. Gosh. David would walk in and I was, he could hear me screaming down the hallway because I was in so much pain. And of course, they can only give you so much morphine and all these right. other heavy drugs at, a, at certain intervals. And I mean, literally, that was what I was left with. And he would just come in, he would grab me, put his arms around me, and he would just pray and just, you know, try to calm me down. And nothing was calming me down. My body was in a court. See, we didn't know what was going on. But the nerves were so damaged yes. that now, right, once the pressure was removed from some of those nerves, that's when my body just like, that's it. Oh, we're my done. gosh. And uh, so, all right. So now we're really concerned. 
did the doctor do something wrong? We didn't know. Um, and he kept saying, she's going to be fine in another six to eight months. David, I ready to hurt somebody. Yes. So David's dad was an MD and he passed away a couple years ago. Just awesome man. And uh, he, uh, David, of course, is telling him all this stuff that's going on with me. I'm out of it. I, I you know, I'm just so drugged. I, I can't hardly talk to anybody. He'd walk into the and because I was in the hospital for probably about three weeks, he'd walk in and I'm laying there in the bed and I'm talking to him. He's, he's at, as far as I know, David's right there at the side of the bed. I'm petting my dog lady, you know, I mean, I'm having these full blown conversations and he's standing at the door watching. This. Oh my gosh. And he's like, oh my gosh, what is happening to my wife? Right. Yes. And, uh, and of course, you know, he'd call nurses at doctors and they're like, I know, but that's the drug she's on. She's in so much pain. Uh, we have to give that to her because her body can't sustain that pain, that pain level. And he's like, well, what's somebody going to do about it? You know? <clears throat> so he's telling his father all of this stuff. And uh, so he goes, well, it's going to be hard to find anybody who will touch her because they'll be afraid of a lawsuit. Right. So he finally, because his father is a, a, a medical doctor one of his fellows that he had gone to school with worked at um, one of the hospitals up in Cleveland. And he said, I will agree to talk with her if she signs paperwork that says she is not going to sue the doctor who did the first surgery, nor will she sue me. Otherwise, um, I won't even talk to her. So this was said to me in my condition, in the state that I'm in, I'm like, who gives a rip about money? Yeah. I want my back to stop hurting and I want my life back. You know what I mean? But everybody was afraid that I was going to sue. I didn't even know anything. How could I sue somebody? I didn't even know what happened. And uh, so we go see him. I sign the paperwork. They do other MRIs and, and uh, back scans and stuff. And he's like, what is it? The, there were disc fragments still in my back pressing against the sciatica nerve oh gosh that is that's I why imagine that that's why all the pain yeah so he said i can come in and i can clean this up that and so this was a neurosurgeon instead of an orthopedic surgeon so here i am going oh my gosh i'm gonna have another surgery what am i gonna be like when i come? you know what i'm saying and I'm crying out to God going, God, I'm so sorry for what I've done to mess up my life. Please help me because please help me. There's nobody else that can help me. So <clears throat> I have the second back surgery and it was a laminectomy, disectomy. And it was then now to go in and clean up all these, you know, little fragments. So he cleaned up as much as he could. But after that second surgery, when I woke up, I was still in major pain, but I was not screaming like, you know, I wasn't my body had it was a, a type of relief, but yet it was a different kind of pain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's weird, but um, it wasn't the same pain. It was another type of pain. But so he explained to David and I what he did to my back. And he said, but he said, your diagnosis is not very good. And I'm like, what do you mean? My diagnosis is not very good. I thought you were supposed to fix me. Right. And uh, he said, well, you are diagnosed with RSD. And I'm like, well, what is that? It's reflex sympathetic dystrophy. What that means is your nerves are so damaged now that they don't know what to do. Like they keep firing. They don't know when to stop, when to relax, when to, they just keep firing nonstop. They just go, go, go. And what that meant was I couldn't even have a sheet covering my legs. Couldn't touch me. Couldn't touch my leg. Couldn't touch my back. I couldn't wear clothes. I mean, it was awful. And so for at least three to four years, I was so out of it. I mean, with all the drugs that I was taking and you know, I'm watching, trying to watch a Christian, you know, like TV and 
and just begging God, please let somebody give me a word of knowledge. I'll just get up and I'll be fine. And, you know, there were days where I said, I'm done, I'm healed. And I threw all my medicine away. Oh, I almost died. Yeah, I almost died. <clears throat> so thank God David came home when he came home and saw what was happening to me. And uh, so now by this time, um, my daughter Tessa and her husband, Joe, sent me a teaching by Andrew Womack. Now, I didn't even know who Andrew Womack was. And it was called Harnessing Your Emotions. <laughs> I know that teaching really well. I opened that up and I looked at it and I just said, you got to be kidding me. And I threw that thing across the room and I said, what are you guys trying to tell me? Right? Yeah, so that didn't go over too well. Well, <clears throat> they kept pursuing and just talking to me and loving on me. And finally, David and I started watching Andrew on TV. And at first, when I first heard him talking about grace, I was like, oh, my gosh, this guy, this is heresy. I, there is something wrong here. There's no way God can love you like that. As, and I mean, you know, I'm internalizing all of this. Yes. There's something in me going, is it possible? But my mind is going, there's just no way. But in my heart, I'm going, could God really love somebody like that? Could God really, truly love somebody like that? Now, I'm still in all this pain, right? Right. But there was something about what he was saying, and I couldn't stop watching. I couldn't stop listening. And so over the span of a few more years, now I'm starting to get it. And I'm like, you know, I can be healed. I can be healed. God wants me well. Well, something starts rising up on the inside of me. And I, I have to tell you, it wasn't my great faith. It was just, I know it was the Holy Spirit, that righteousness in me. You know, the Bible says this, this scripture here, well, two of them, Galatians 2.16, where it says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, my works, my goodness, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, right? And then it says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And I was experiencing that, but I didn't know what it was. It was his faith rising up on the inside of me saying, this is not who you are. You are not going to be on a walker the rest of your life. You are going to get up. You're going to work. You're forgiven. You're healed. You're going to live out your life and you're going to fulfill my will. And I'm like, I am. <laughs> I mean, you know, all these things are going on in the inside of me. And I told David one day, I said, I'm done. He goes, what do you mean you're done? <laughs> and I said, I am not going to live like this for the rest of my life. And he goes, well, what are you going to do? Now, remember, David's still a pretty young Christian. Right, right. <laughs> he's just seen, he's wondering, why is God letting this happen to me, Right. And I'm wondering why God is letting this happen to me. <clears throat> and uh, I said, well, first of all, I'm going to get up and I'm going to start walking. Now, mind you, the furthest I had walked is from a bed to a bathroom. David had to do everything for me. He had to shower me. He had to do my hair. Most of the time he had to get me to the bathroom, you know, on my walker. Because right. the pain was so intense. I was doing uh, aquatic therapy being in the water so I could move a little more freely and uh, but it really wasn't helping I mean it was helping but very not. Little, right so I get now to the point where I'm like okay you know what I this is not who God made me to be so I take my walker and I'm like I don't care what I feel like I don't care what it looks like I had slippers on and I had big baggy sweatpants because I couldn't have anything tied around my waist. I looked like probably an old bag lady somewhere. I know I did, but I didn't care. And so I took my little walker and I went outside by myself. And I said, I'm going to walk. And I started walking with my walker. 
And, you know, I don't know, a couple months went by. I said, I don't need this walker. I got my cane. And I started walking with a cane and then went from walking with a cane to said, I don't need this cane. I just started walking on my own. Now I was still in pain, but the pain was starting to go away. And I'm like, how is this possible? You know, I'm going back to the doctor and I'm telling him, you know, I don't think I need as strong a pain medication. He goes, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, well, wow. look at this. Yeah. He, he goes, can, can you walk on your toes? I said, I can. He goes, what? I start going up on my toes. You know, you can't do that with RSD because your toes won't work. They won't go up. And uh, he goes, what about walking on your heels? I'm like, I can walk on my heels, you know? And he's just, I mean, my the pain management doctor now, he's telling me, he says, I have never seen anyone recover from this ever. And I mean, he had been a doctor for a long time and he started calling me his miracle patient. That is you know? awesome. But that was so good for my heart because it was like, I was hearing somebody, he knew he was a believer. And, but I was hearing somebody tell me what was possible. Yeah. You know, the whole time I'm watching Andrew and I'm learning about the grace of God. I'm learning that God loves you apart from your performance, apart from what he saved you when you were in your sin. So your sin now is not going to separate you from him. But that was just so wild to me. Right. And, uh, so, like I said, as I start doing this, I'm getting better and better and better. <clears throat> now, I'm not back to work yet. And, uh, of course, we lost almost everything we had. We had, uh, but David had two 401ks. I had one. They both were good 401ks. We probably would have retired really well, but we had to use everything to pay for medical bills because, remember, I didn't, the insurance from that other company. Yes, yeah. Plus, they couldn't hold my job any longer when they realized what was really going on with me. They had to let me go. And uh, so now I don't have a job and it's just David and <clears throat> all these things. And uh, so I said, you know what? I've got a lot of experience in some stuff. I said, I'm going to start my own business. David's like, you're going, what? I said, I'm going to start my own business. Next thing you know, I've started my own business. One of the girls that used to work with me where I used to work, she's now going to nursing school and I'm telling her what I'm going to do. She goes, can I come help you? I'm like, yes, you can <laughs> come help me. Really? And I started my own business and I had a business for four years, almost four years. And by that time now, now I'm back into the working realm. I'm working full time, running around doing things. And it was like all of a sudden your brain and your body goes, oh my gosh, my back is healed. I'm not in all this pain wow. and all this stuff, you know, just torture trying to bend down or trying to put your shoes on, you know. And in the beginning, it was like, I, I thought, well, maybe it's just willpower. I'm just willing myself. You, right. can't, will, you can't will yourself out of that pain. And well, so you also, know. also took the focus off of your back. Yes. And you put the focus on your business that you had opened. Well, not just that, but now I'm thinking that God might just really, truly love me and can. Oh, okay. yes. And if he does, that too. Yeah. and if he does, then that means God loves his kids. Would I want my kids to be sick and in pain? No, God doesn't. Nope. And I knew that. I knew it in my head but I didn't know it in my heart, right? And so, you know, my healing of my back was an overtime progressive healing. Yeah. And you know, just kind of like Nikki said, Nikki Weller, right? Um, when she shares sometimes about her being healed, hers was progressive. It's not because that's how God wanted it to be, but that's where I was. Absolutely. And as God's changing things, you know, little by little by little by little, you know, Really, Andrew Womack and um, Joseph Prince, but mainly Andrew Womack, was such an influence in my life. In I get getting, it. In getting me to that point. And then I'm watching healing journeys. <laughs> I'm 
I'm watching events. I'm watching Healing is Here. I'm watching Healing School, you know, all these things. And I'm like, oh my gosh, where has this stuff been my whole life, right? And uh, so now I'm going to take you up to 2016. Well, 2010. Now, by this time, man, I'm, I'm good. Man, I'm running all over. I'm working. You know, I'm telling people how much Jesus loves them again, you know, and stuff. And trying to convince myself he loves me at the same time. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, my youngest daughter and her husband they're, they're living in Ohio, right? And they're working at the church that we're all going to and everything. And they come and tell us that we feel called to go to Colorado. And I'm like, what do you mean you feel called to go, go to Colorado? You can't go to Colorado. You have to stay here, right? And they tell me, they tell us, start telling us about Karis Bible College. And I'm like, what's that? And they're like, well, you know how you've been watching Andrew Womack all this time? He has a Bible college. And I'm like, so? <laughs> And she's like, God told us I'm supposed to go. So they move and they come out to Colorado and they go to school. She goes to first and second year. And then her, then her husband, Joe, in between first and second, he's like, he felt like God was telling him to go too. So she skipped a year so that they could do second year together. And then she does third year worship up here. And so she graduates in 2014. Well, they both were graduated. And they moved to Oklahoma. Now, mind you, David and I are still going through, you know, like, even though my back is healed, symptoms try to come back, you know, and so, right. so I'm trying to learn how to stand against things, you know, and seriously, fear had such a grip on my life. And I didn't under, I didn't know how much fear had a grip on my life. So that, that the is, enemy, it is, I well, know no, that's, that's what destroys it all. It no is. Matter. It how is. much you know of the word, but if the enemy is, is literally, we call it that, that stabbing every day, trying yeah. to destroy you. I know. I love it when you teach on fear, not on fear, but how to be free from it. <laughs> or why do you allow fear? You know, yeah. it's your enemy, you know? And I mean, so man, keep on preaching that, Julianne, because yeah, just keep on preaching that word. <clears throat> and uh, because we don't, none of us really truly realize how much fear has really devastated areas of our life until the Holy Spirit starts to reveal it. And yes. It and we're going, all right, yeah, this is not going to keep happening. You know, this is what my, my Jesus says about this. This is what the word of God says about this. <clears throat> so through all that, because fear is still there, that I didn't realize how much it was, you know, other symptoms are trying to come on me. Well, now we've got Joe and Tessa just sharing all the things that are happening in their life, coming to school out here. We've, we, we're coming out twice a year to see them. We're going to the ministry, you know, and I'm like, my gosh, these kids, their lives are totally, it's like just so changed, you know? Not that there was anything really wrong before, but now there's something different. Right. Them, right. And, or, and we're just like really seeing it now, right. That fruit of what's going on in their lives. They never once, you know, said, well, you guys need to come out here to school or you need to do this or you need to do that. It was just, they just loved us. They would share the word with us, you know, and different areas that they knew that maybe we were struggling. And, um, so uh, now they graduate in 2014, moved to Oklahoma, and now they're both working at a wonderful church in Oklahoma. And Tess is their worship leader, and Joe is a community pastor, a youth pastor. He's just doing, I mean, they're just doing amazing, right? Because God had called them there to do it. And uh, so now a couple of years has gone by and we keep coming out here to, you know, we'll go visit them down in Oklahoma now and everything. And all of a sudden I start having these thoughts about Karis Bible College. I mean, literally just start thinking about this. And I'm like, why am I thinking these thoughts? You know, I'm watching Andrew every day. I'm watching all anything and everything on that website. I mean, I was devouring it. I'd go back in the archives to as far back as I could go to watch stuff and, you know, just to 
just, I wanted to learn more about this grace and that how can all these people be healed of all these things just instantly? And, you know, what am I missing? And what do I need to know? And, you know, I'm just going after it. And so is David, right? So now we're both, you know, going in the same direction. And so this goes, this goes on for about a month or so. And finally, one morning, David and I are sitting in the living room, Saturday morning, reading our Bibles, drinking our coffee. And I just felt like I was going to explode. And I just turned and I look at him and I said, David, he's like, yeah. And, you know, I kept him hawing around. I couldn't say it. I couldn't say he goes, finally, he goes, Colleen, what do you need to say? You know, and have you ever thought about going to Bible school? (laughs) And that's all I said. And he looks over at me. He says, you mean Karis Bible College? And I looked at him. So here God had been talking to him Mm. and talking to me. And neither one of us was going to say anything to the other person because we're both telling God how much the other person would not want to go. Right. (laughs) And so in 2016, David and I come out here for a campus days and just one miracle after another, after another, after another. And we signed up while we were out here. That was in April of 2016. And of course, I I was not sharing anything about how my back was healed. I was, it was fear. I was afraid to share it, that something would happen to me. I was afraid to share it. That's that bad doctrine out there. Yeah, you are absolutely right, Julianne, because it was keeping me from being even more free, right? About fearing what God had really done for me. And so- um, Well, not only did you guys go there, but you also work for the ministry. Mm -hmm, Yeah. You know, we have to share our testimonies and that's why your testimony on the journey has been, will be very important because we really tracked um, for three episodes you know, all the things, you know, the back injury, yes, you might've been carrying some stuff, but you were carrying a load of a lot of other issues and problems. That kind of stuff of the things that happened to you with, you know, the husbands, the the abuse, um, the cheating on you, all of that stuff. It's it's like another suitcase you're carrying, but you're carrying it all inside your heart. And we're just not meant to carry that. And so God not only healed your back, but he healed your whole life completely. And um, and in every possible way, and look at the amazing uh, marriage that you have. And I don't know your older daughter, but I do know your younger daughter, and what a amazing young woman she is. Yeah. And I mean, just yeah, you just want to be around her. She's just yeah. she's happiness, you know, walking happiness. The sun <laughs> Absolutely. is absolutely it is. Yeah. She is. Yeah, wherever Tessa is, I don't care how cold it is in Colorado. Wherever Tess is, the sun is shining. That's right. So now what I'd like you to do, because we are out of time now, is to, I'd like you to pray for the people that have gone through similar, maybe worse and maybe not as bad, Mm -hmm. but to really pray for them to get to the root of this, the core of what has happened in their life and literally rip it out. Amen. That they can be free. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much, first of all, for, you know, just this platform for what Healing Journeys today is doing for so many people around the world, because I know I'm one of them. And I just thank you for the things that you are capable of that we don't give you credit for, that you do the impossible, but you do it through us. And Father, I pray for every man and woman out there, or even, you know, children or teenagers that have gone through so much trauma in their young lives. And as they've grown up and they've carried just baggage that you never meant for them to carry, that they will look to you. You only begin to focus their heart their minds on you and that no matter the lies of the enemy that come their way that they will remind themselves my father loves me jesus 
laid his life down for me because he loved me. That I am loved by the God of this universe because it is only your love that breaks the power of every fear, every trauma, every lie, your love and your truth. So I pray right now, Father, that by your spirit, it's not by my words, but it's your words, it's your truth and your Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, I pray right now that I know there's <clears throat> many people out there that have said, I've had, I know what you're talking about, Colleen, and my life has been a mess but it can turn around right now, today. Make that same decision. Let that same righteousness that you have on the inside of you to rise up and to say, today I make a change in my life. Holy Spirit, help me. Open the eyes of my understanding. Flood my heart with light so that I can stand up courageously and begin to walk out of the bondage that I have been held in. And Father, I thank you that that is your will. And because it's your will, we agree together right now that it's being done all over the world. Bondages are caught falling off. Lies are being exposed. Truth is coming up and rising up in the hearts of your children, and they are seeing just how much you love them. I just speak healing, physical healing, emotional healing, mental healing over every person right now. It's like I just see the covering, the glory of God that's within them, but it's affecting them outwardly. Father, I thank you right now that that is happening, that people are experiencing change right now. And we give you all the glory and the honor and the credit. And we thank you so much, how much we appreciate you and love you. In Jesus, your son's name, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Colleen. That is that prayer that made a impact and it will. What I love about this is that this can go on from someone that watches it for the first day it comes out and 10 years from now. Oh. So there's no there's no time limit on it. Well, thank you so much, Colleen, thank you. for giving me uh, and us, all of us, uh, a big, huge part of your life to look into your life and to dig into the details of your testimony so that people can see that they also can be set free from anything that they've done in their life. And you know what? Who cares anyway? Cause it's all about Jesus, you know? Amen. Amen. It is so all about you. him. And um, I hope everybody enjoyed it. I know they have. Yeah. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Can you even imagine that she not only has one back surgery and then they tell her that that's going to be it and, and in six to eight weeks they're going to be completely fine and then to find out that they messed up her back surgery, that they made a mistake and this would now bring on all these other conditions like RSD, like also being on so many drugs, so much medication that she doesn't even know who she is half the time. Oh my gosh, what an amazing story. But the, the overall arcing story of all of this is redemption. You know, we, 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 we saw the whole journey of both of the episodes, that, uh, the first two episodes, and then we see this one. We see that because of all the problems that happened to her with all the rejection, the abuse, the, uh, the several marriages, the, just the, the condemnation on herself and the shame on herself, we see that that was a setup by the enemy to bring her to a place where she possibly could not function anymore. So I just want you to know that there is hope for you. Jesus Christ is the healer and there is nothing else that will heal you like he does. He does a complete work. 
He doesn't do half. He doesn't do partial. He does it all. So thank you guys so much for tuning in every week. Not only just the journey, but all the teachings on Healing Journeys today. Because together we are all now a part of each other's lives. And you are receiving your freedom from whatever it is that is put you in bondage. So thank you so much for joining us. Go to HealingJourneysToday.com. And if you want to help us out, there's a place to donate there. And you, can, you are making a big difference in this ministry. And also, you always definitely want to share these videos. You know somebody that I don't know. Please share them, subscribe, so that we can get this word out to the world and that people will be receiving their healing on a daily basis. Thank you so much and God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.